Well, yesterday we had a ton of fun, didn't we? I had fun. It, 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 was, it was a fun time at Disneyland. I, we went on a ton of rides. I, th I th honestly think we hit, like, pretty much all the good ones, other than maybe Indiana Jones. We missed that one. But uh, Haunted Mansion's lame, so I, I don't really – it's not, I, I don't think we really missed out on the Hunt to Mansion. But I thought we went on a lot of fun rides. Star Tours, I think that's very underrated. That's a really fun ride. Um, not, only, not only is it a fun ride, but you get to sit down in air conditioning for a good you know, 15 minutes. That is, that's a win in my book, especially after how tired our legs were. Star Tours was fun. Um, Buzz was fun. Um, it was fun beating everyone in this room, getting the highest score. Um, right, Ethan? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One shot, one shot, I beat Ethan. But that was really fun. I love Buzz Lightyear. Um, Space Mountain was really fun. We got some uh, funny pictures. Me and Owen got in like the funniest picture. And Ray, yeah, Owen was like combing his hair like, like mid picture. No, that was, that was really funny. Um, trying to think. But I think the highlight of the day was Thunder Mountain when we did our Fast Pass. And yeah, there it is. That's pretty funny. Uh, Thunder Mountain when we had the uh, fireworks going off in the background. Like, like we're climbing, we're climbing Thunder Mountain and we go down and there's like fireworks and the Tinkerbell things like going across the sky and everything. Like, I thought that was one of the coolest parts of the whole day. So from what I gathered, I thought everyone here had fun. Um, but what I didn't hear yesterday is um, anyone talking about and celebrating and, and saying it was so fun to, to, to stand in line. Did it, it, was anyone like, oh man, lines, like, oh yeah, it was so cool. Matterhorn was like, Matter, we had a little bit of fun in, in the Matterhorn line. But for the most part, I mean, unless you're with the right people, which I thought we were with the right people, ma lines are normally not, not very fun, are they? I mean, waiting an hour for Matterhorn to get your back, like, misaligned because you're, like, in so much pain after. Um, what? Was it an hour? It was, I think it was an hour for Matterhorn. It, it was short for you guys? Wow, it felt like eternity for me. I don't know what... what I don't know what happened to you guys. We, play, we did play that fun game in line. Yeah, well, because we had a fast pass, that's, that's why. But for the most part, lines, lines, like, can we all agree, like, like, okay, we've got all the exceptions. But for the most part, lines aren't really fun. Those, those are not really the reason you go to Disneyland. You don't go to Disneyland to wait an hour for Matterhorn. You go to Disneyland to ride Matterhorn and to ride Space Mountain and, and Thunder Mountain and all of the other rides that we went on. It's, it's fun because we, we celebrate the right things. When you go to Disneyland, you're never confused about what you're celebrating and what you're going there for. But I think oftentimes when it comes to Christmas, we are sometimes a little confused, whether consciously or unconsciously, about what we're, what we're celebrating. You go to Disneyland, you know you want to celebrate the rides and the fireworks and the fun, but you don't really celebrate the lines and the crowds and all of those things. And I think oftentimes with Christmas, we do, uh, we do miss the point. And so that's what that's what this series is all about. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Um, the, the, here in the month of December, I want to, to talk with you guys about how we can not waste our Christmas, how we can use our Christmas for the glory of God, how we can worship God um, because of our Christmas, um, because Christmas ultimately um, it, it is a time for us to pause, to step back from, from the busyness of life, um, and, and to celebrate what God did um, for us uh, by sending um, his son. And so last week we talked about, if you were here, we talked about keeping Jesus as the focal point of our attention during the Christmas season. Well, today I want to talk about uh, keeping Jesus as the focal point of our praise this Christmas and, and, and as, our, as our worship this um, Christmas. I want us to all joyfully celebrate um, the coming of Christ um, this Christmas the way that we ought to. So I want you to turn back to Luke chapter 2. Very familiar passage because we sang it like, or uh, recited it like five times yesterday at the houses, but I want to go over basically the passage that we, that we, w that we said to these, um, to, to the people that we went to their houses. But I, I want to, I want to stop for a minute. I want to talk about what, what this means, what, um, glory to God in the highest means and, and that, that section. So I'm going to read verse, um, eight through verse 20, but we are going to uh, zone in on, on verse 13 to verse 20 because we talked about verse uh, 10 through 12 last week. So if you would, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. We read it yesterday a few times, but let's read it again right now. It says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. 
And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Then suddenly there's with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. And when the angel went away from them into heaven, the, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and let's see the thing that had happened which the Lord um, has made known to us. And they went there with haste and found Joseph, found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up these things in her heart, pointing, pondering them um, in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for what they had seen as it had been told to them. So I want to zone in, like I said, on verse uh, 13 through verse 20, because we talked about uh, Luke 2.11, the famous Christmas passage, um, last, last week. But I want you to, uh, I read that whole passage here, because I want you to remember the, what the context is. And we talked about it a little bit yesterday as we were going and, uh, quote-unquote, caroling to the, to the houses that we went to, um, monotonely caroling to the houses that we went to. The, the, the context here is these shepherds, they're out in the field by, by themselves, you know, minding their own business, doing their job. And, and then one angel shows up and says, you know, born this day in the city of David, the Savior has been Christ the Lord. And then, like we recited yesterday to those people, a, a, a bunch of these, of these angels show up, a multitude of angels show up. They were, I mean, if you think about it for, for a minute, what, what is an angel? An angel uh, are, those, are those heavenly beings that, that reside in heaven. So, so they're, they're there with, with God the Father, they're with God the Son, God the Spirit, before Jesus ever came to, to be on this planet. So they knew Jesus. They knew how big of a deal this, this Christmas thing was. They knew that, that Jesus taking on flesh, be, being coming um, incarnate was our word la, from last week, in, in the incarnation, like carne asada, right? The meat, Christ coming down and becoming meat is what, is what, what we celebrate here at Christmas, they knew this Jesus and they wanted to celebrate and they wanted to sing and how great this is. So it's, it's weird. It, it, we don't use these phrases here in English um, very much or if we do, we don't really know what they mean. But what, 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 are, they, what are they saying here when, they, when, they're, when they're singing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased? So that's, that's what I want to dig in um, here, uh, here, here in a minute. But I want you to write down for point number one first. I want you to write down, experience Christmas peace, because this is what they are coming to preach. This is what the angels are here to, to celebrate and, and to preach to these people. They're, 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 they're preaching that, that Christmas is, is bringing peace. So I want, I want us to, to experience this Christmas peace that these angels were, were singing about. So what, what are they saying here? Glory to God in the highest. I want to I dig into that first. Maybe you guys have heard the phrase or sung the phrase, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Have you sung that before? Yeah, everyone sung it before? Angels we have around the night, Gloria, <laughs> right? We've sung that before? In excelsis Deo, so that's, that's what, this, what this phrase is here. Gloria in excelsis Deo is just, it, it's, a, it's a Latin translation actually, but, but, but this, is, this is the text that it's coming from right here in, in Luke 2.14. This is where the lyrics come from. Glory to God in the highest. So what does he mean by saying glory to God in the highest? So glory, it's not one of those words that we like know really how to define. Maybe you've said it before. Maybe you say, I want to give glory to God. But, but what does it really mean? Tangibly, what, what, is he, what, what are they actually saying here? And so it, it's hard to translate in, into like common street terms. But I, I think the best way to, to, to translate what he's saying when he says glory to God in the highest is Glory, it's the idea of greatness. There's this, there's this greatness that's being proclaimed. And glory to God in the highest is basically, I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, it's, it's these, these angels giving the greatest greatness to God that they possibly could give. The, the, the most credit, the most honor, the most, uh, um, I almost used the word glory. That doesn't really help you in defining a word by using the word. But, but they're, they're ascribing the greatest greatness to God. It, I mean, the, the word glory, it, it, it has this, this word picture of, of, of heaviness, of weightiness. There's this, there's this greatness. There, there's this real tangible good thing that has happened and they are just describing the greatest greatness that they possibly could. I mean, another way to put it in, in like the most simple, simple terms is like, like, you guys are familiar with goat, like greatest of all time, right? 
This is just the goat of praises right here, right here. Luke 2, 14, it's the goat of praise. It's the greatest of all time. It's the most like praise that, you, that they could give to God. Glory to God in the highest. The greatest greatness that could be ascribed to God, I want it to be ascribed to God because this is the greatest gift that has ever happened to this world is this baby Jesus here. So, so the angels, they understand Jesus. They know where he's coming from, literally from heaven. And they're saying, okay, now that he's here on earth, the greatest greatness that could be ascribed to God the most credit that God could get because of this great thing, I want to give that to him. So that's basically what they're saying when they say glory to God in the highest. They're praising him, they're worshiping him, they're crediting him with this great gift of Christ. Because at this point in time, this is the greatest event in all of history at this point. I, w- I would say maybe the cross is the greatest point in all of history, but, but at, to, to this point, when Jesus is born, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened. And so they go from th- these heavenly beings singing about what has what has happened, I, I, I find it interesting that it goes straight from the glory to God in the highest and then it goes immediately to, to the ramifications that happen here on earth. So we're talking about the greatest greatness to God who's in the highest heavens, who's in the greatest, you know, farther than we can comprehend, high, higher than us. And then this God that is way up there, he cares for the people down here on earth. And so they're saying, wow, this great gift that God has given, the, the God of, of heaven and earth, the creator of all the universe, the one that's way up there, he loves the earth right here. Great, glory to God in the highest. And then on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. God cares about what's happening here on earth. In this passage, or this, uh, this uh, stanza here, this, this phrase, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased, it's also another um, oftentimes mistranslated um, verse. Maybe you've heard peace on earth, goodwill to men. Have you ever heard that before? In a Christmas carol, it came upon a midnight clear. Have you heard that song? Well, it says peace on earth, goodwill to men. Well, that's obviously not what your, what your ESV text here says because that's, that's a poor translation because the peace here in this passage, it's not peace on earth, a, a horizontal peace that's happening here on earth, but Christmas it's not about that kind of peace. It's about the peace that we can have with God, the vertical peace. So it's saying there's peace now on earth with, with those who God is pleased with. So basically, a.k.a. there's peace on earth because of Jesus for Christians. It's basically what he's saying. There's peace now that has come through Jesus Christ. This is a vertical peace with God that these, these angels are glorifying God for. They're saying, greatest greatness to you be ascribed, O God. And then they say, why? Because, because you've now, now given us this gift of peace. And that's a picture of what salvation is. Peace is salvation. Salvation is peace. We've talked about the last couple of weeks. I talked about it last week. We talked about it in the book of Colossians. Is it, we're born into this sinful state, into sinful flesh, rebelling against God and, and really we, we have no peace with God at, at all. We are, I, I would argue, we're at war with God. If, you, if you're not a Christian, you, you, your, your sins are still on your account. God looks at your sin and he, and he hates your sin be, because he can't dwell in the presence of sin. And so now there's, now there's war with God. There, there's, there's this bad news that, that you're in a bad spot. And, and because of Christmas, because of what Jesus did, he, he now offers this, this free gift uh, of peace. You're at war with God. He demands perfection. You can't match up to it. I mean, that's literally what the word sin means. The, the word literally sin means to miss the mark. And, and that's what you and I have done to God. We, God. God demands perfection from us. I mean, think about perfection for a minute. That, that's like never, never, you know, talking bad behind someone's back. That's um, every time you've um, disobeyed your parents every time you've cheated on your homework and copied someone else's homework. Every time you've um, thought bad thoughts in your heart towards someone. Man, I don't like them. I hate them. They're the worst. They're so annoying. I wish I could never be with them. Uh, every time you say something foolish to someone, you hurt them with your words. Every time you do, they're missing the, per- the perfect mark of God. And because of that, like, like I said, there, there's now war with God because we've, because we've messed up. But God has provided the solution here in Christ. If you would turn over with me to Romans chapter 3. It gives us this very clear and distinct picture of what 
what Christ did, the, the solution that now Christ has, has supplied for us, the peace that he has now given us with not, not each other, but the peace that now he's given us with, with God, the vertical peace that we have with God. Romans chapter 3, I want you to look at verse uh, 21 through 26. I remember I was in Bible school, um, M currently, um, but when I was in class, I, I just remember one of my professors saying, this right here is the most important paragraph in the whole Bible. He said, this paragraph right here is the most important paragraph in all of the Bible. And that caught my attention like, whoa. So I want to read what my professor said is the most important paragraph in all of the Bible. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 26, it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law through the, prophet, through the law and the prophets that bear witness to it. Or, or Although the, the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So basically what he's saying here is now the righteousness of God, the perfection of God, the holiness of God is now manifested, is now, that's a fancy way of saying revealed, being showed to you. Manifested is being showed something. And so now the righteousness of God has now been showed, shown to us through something apart from the law. That's obviously would be Christ. Look at verse 22. It says, The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but now are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So basically, the righteousness of God is now, is now given through Christ. So now you, someone who's at war with God, who does not have peace with God at all, can now be given this, this righteousness of God so that when, when God now sees you, he now sees the perfection of God, or uh, of, of Jesus rather. You've been justified. You've now been made right with, with God. Verse 24, by his grace as a gift through the redemption, through the buying back of Jesus Christ, whom God the Father put, put Jesus for it as a propitiation, big Bible word for saying as a means of forgiveness. So, so basically, God is able to now forgive us through the, the propitiation, if you will, of his blood, uh, of Christ's blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. This was now, now for God to give you righteousness was so that, so that now you can have this righteousness through Christ's blood. Verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, so that he might not pass over sins, you know, half-heartedly, but he's also the justifier. So, so he's not going not gonna to fold on, on his justice, but he's also the one who can now supply you with the righteousness so that you can be forgiven of your sin, of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus, it says. God provides us the solution in Christ. If there was no Christmas, like we said last week, if there was no Christmas, there would be no gospel. You would have no hope. You would still be at war with God. I would still be at war with God. We'd be wasting our time here on a Sunday morning opening up the word if, if Jesus never came. Now you can have peace with God because of this. And so that's why the angels are rejoicing. That's why they are singing the greatest greatness, the goat of praises, of the greatest praise of all time is now right here in, in Luke 2.14 because they know what's going to happen. They know that Jesus is now bringing Christmas peace. Again, not horizontal peace, but, but vertical peace with God. So it begs the question, how, how do we get this peace with God? And we're, we're going to get to that here in a minute, but I want to I look at how the shepherds here responded in Luke 2. Luke 2, uh, look back at uh, verse uh, 15 with me. So after these, these angels show up, they sing the, the greatest praise of all time. Greatest greatness be ascribed to God for what he's done. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now he has offered this Christmas peace for, for his people. Verse 15, when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and let's see the thing that has happened which the Lord has now made known to us. And they went with haste. And they went with haste. And they went with haste haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. So they go right away. They, 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 I mean, these guys have a job. Like your job right now, maybe you don't have a real job. You, you have school and that's your job right now. Like they're, they're leaving their, their job, their, their responsibility to go and to see what, what Jesus now has done. They are, if you will, they're making Jesus Christ their top priority. So I want you to write that down for point number two. Make Jesus your top priority. Ultimately, if you boil it down to one thing, that, that, that is essentially 
you could word it in a million different ways, but th- that's how this Christmas piece comes about. That's how you can get this Christmas piece, is if Christ is your top priority. These guys, they, le- they leave everything. If you think back to, you know, when Jesus called his disciples in, in the Gospels, um, what did Peter do? He shows up to Peter and he says, hey, Peter, come follow me. I'll make you fisher men. And Peter's like, okay. And then he just like leaves his boat. He leaves his business. He leaves his net like out there on the boat and he leaves everything he knows, his job, and he just follows Christ. What does he do to, to Matthew, the Levi, the tax collector? He's sitting at his booth at his job doing his thing. Jesus comes up, says, hey, follow me. And he's like, okay, I'll drop everything and I will follow you. That's the picture of what it looks like to follow Christ. If Christ is your top priority, you will, you will leave everything to follow him. You know, if something is your extreme priority, if, if it's, something is your top priority, you actually, I'll prove to you here in a minute, you are willing to actually leave everything. It's like yesterday, we were at Disneyland. We can all here agree, small world is such a lame ride, okay? Everyone in this room, everyone in this room can agree, small world, it might be the worst ride at Disneyland. Maybe... Maybe worse, it might be worse than poo, the poo ride. Okay, I, 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 I think Small World is super lame, but great thing, great thing. We didn't go on it yesterday, okay? So let's say, let's say Small World, you go to Disneyland, it's the, it's the bottom of your priority list. It's, it's ride number 10 that you want to ride on. Like, you want to ride on nine other rides before you want to ride on Small World. But Space Mountain's your favorite ride because it's so fun. It's so great. Space Mountain's the best. So, so we're, we're, say, picture this. We're here at Disneyland. We're in the line for Small World, number 10 on our priority list. It's a 90-minute wait. Okay? Why we got in line for the 90-minute wait at Small World. What a waste of time. We come to, we, someone pulls out their app and says, Dude, guess what? Space Mountain's only five minutes. What are you going to do? I don't care if you're like near the front of the line. You're going to like, all right, let's, uh, I'm going to grab my backpack. Let's go. Let's go to Space Mountain because that's the best ride. We're at the worst ride. Let's go to the best ride. I'm willing to leave everything, no matter where you are in line. Would you be willing to, to, to leave Small World's line anywhere? Like I could be at the front. Like I could be stepping in, finding out Space Mountain's like five minutes and then I'm turning around because I'm like, no, I don't want to go on this ride because it's lame. I want to go on Space Mountain. It's only five minutes. Kai, <laughs> it's true. Kai definitely would have jumped out of the boat. There's, n- there's no doubt. No, we didn't go on Small World, and th- this is why, because it is so lame. But the point is proven. If you have something that's on the top of your priority list, what are you willing to do? You're willing to leave everything. You could be in line even at the popcorn stand, like, like your buddy Mark, who wanted popcorn like, like from noon till about 10, and I finally let him at like 10 to like get his popcorn. But anyway... It was so funny. But I'm willing to leave anything to go to Space Mountain. Why? Because it's only five minutes. Because it's right there. It's a, it, it's, it's, I can walk right on. It's the top of my priority list. It's better than what, what's going on right now. And so, so that's kind of a picture of that, that's what we need to do with, with Jesus. We need to make Jesus our top priority, leaving everything else. And right now you're on Small World. And, and Space Mountain's five minutes long. The, the line is. Make Jesus your top priority. And that's what the shepherds did. They, they recognized that and they, they, what does it say? I read it three times in a row. If you missed it, then you weren't, you're asleep or something. Verse 16, they, and they went with haste. They went quickly. They went right away. Immediately, they left and they went to go. Do this right now. And I can't necessarily say that this, this picture right here is the shepherds getting saved. This is the salvation of the shepherds. But I think we can learn a few things about making Jesus our top priority because that's that's how you get saved is you make Jesus your top priority. I'm going to talk about two things. Two things you need to make Jesus the top priority over uh, top priority of your life. Two things and that's how you get saved. The first one or I'll, I'll just say them two right now. You need to make Jesus the top priority over, over, over sin and over yourself. Those are the two things. Over sin. I'll talk, talk, talk about that one first. Maybe the Bible word that you've heard before is repentance. You need to make, make Christ a top priority over your sin. I, I care about what God says more about my sin. I am going to repent. I am going to turn from my sin. 
say, you know what, I, I'm done living my life for gossip. I'm done living my life for disobedience. I'm done living my life for rebellion. I'm done living my life for cussing. I am going to turn and I am going to live for this instead. I am going to put down my sin, turn around from it, and I'm going to follow Christ. Acts 3.19, I, I love what it says. It says, repent therefore, turn back. That's a good picture of what repentance is. Turn back that your sins may be blotted out. The first thing you have to do to get saved is you have to repent of your sin. Making Jesus the top priority over your sin. Destroying all avenues to sin. I don't know if you're familiar with this. I won't make you turn there, but in Acts 19, um, pa Paul's preaching to all these people and there's these um, people that he's preaching to and they were uh, magicians. You guys know this story? The, there's these, he preaches the gospel to these magicians and they get, they get saved in Acts 19. And so what they all do, magic, we would say, like real magic, like, I don't know, all those like magicians in Vegas, like, that's one thing, that's the trickery. But, like these real guys were, were turning up like evil spirits and all this kind of stuff, this is wrong and sinful. And what, what do they do? They get saved, and what's the first thing they do? They go out into the town square, they throw their books out there in the middle, and then they just burn them. They, they, they burn all of their books. Why? Because they don't want, they, they're, they're turning back away from that sin. I, I was living for magic before and now I'm going to live for Christ instead. I'm going to leave my sin behind. I'm going to destroy all avenues that I can to sin. Christian life looks different after you get saved because you're, you're constantly turning from your sin. It starts at one point, but it continues for the rest of your life. Repentance is saying, I'm done with this sin from now on. It, repentance is not, I'll try better next time, or oopsies, I messed up, I'll do better next time, I guess. No, no, repentance is saying, you know what, I, I hate this sin of gossip, I, I'm going to let it go. I, I hate this sin of anxiety, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to run to, to Christ instead of this. I'm going to put this behind me, I'm going to turn from it, and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to, go to Christ instead. Repentance. The, the, the word, the, the Greek word for this, for repentance, the, the word is metanoia, which basically the, the, the word picture that it creates is it's a change of mind. It's a change of thinking. You, you, you view sin differently. It, it, you don't view it the same. For your Christian, you're like, you know, I, I can gossip or, yeah, I can disobey my parents or, yeah, I can use that kind of language and whatever. Like, it, it's, it, is just, it is what it is. It's not really a big deal. But, but rep real repentance is saying, you know what, I, I'm viewing that sin differently. I, I'm saying, you know what, I, I'm not going to live for that anymore. I'm actually going to live for what, what God commands me to do instead. You see sin completely differently. You wage war against sin. You struggle against sin. You hate sin. Your whole life is defined by, by fighting sin. You've got to make Christ that priority over your sin. The next thing is over yourself. We like to call this faith. We say repentance and faith. So those are the two big, big words that we use here at church all the time. Is to get saved, you've got to repent of your sin and place your faith in Christ. Making Christ a priority over yourself. Putting your faith in Him. What, what are we talking about here? Well, putting your faith in Him is a discard of trust in your own righteousness, your own good deeds to, to make you right with God. Putting your faith, not in your own anymore, but now putting your faith in Christ and saying, you know what? I trust that, that Christ paid the penalty. I trust that, that Christ was the perfect spotless lamb that I couldn't be. There's no, nothing I can do. There's no, no song I can sing. There's no action I can do. There's no anything that I could live for to, to, to make myself right with God, to fix myself and to, 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 to have God look at me and say, you know what, Matt, you're, you're actually good. You really did. You helped the old lady across the street a hundred times. You're, you're good. I mean, you earned it. Welcome to, welcome to heaven. That's not, how, that's not how it works. Good deeds don't, don't get us anywhere. You, they don't save you. You've got to put your, put your trust in, in Christ's good deeds instead, in Christ's perfect righteousness. Write down Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9. Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9 says, For his sake, referring to Christ, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish or as trash in order that I may gain Christ and be gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not that I, I completed anything, basically is what he's saying, but the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So you're done trusting in what you can do. You're done trusting in your resume, you know? 
you got a resume. You probably don't have a resume right now, but I remember in school you like create a resume for a class or something like that. You're like, oh, these are my education, you know? Hughes Middle School, current <laughs> student. Like, like you, you put all of the, everything that you've done in, in your life, on your, on your resume. And so Christianity is saying, you know what? I know that my resume is messed up. I know that my resume is not going to, you know, to further the illustration, get me the job. I'm, I'm not going to trust in this anymore. I'm going to, I'm switching that out. I'm going to look at Christ who, who, who is the perfect, the perfect resume, who always obeyed his parents, who never thought that bad thought, who never talked about the person wrongly behind their back, who never said anything wrong to, to his mom or dad. I'm going to trust in, in him instead. I'm going to put my faith in what he has done instead of myself. That's how you respond to the gospel. That's how you get this Christmas peace. You make Jesus the priority over your sin and over yourself. Repentance and faith. If you don't do that, you don't have peace with God. God still looks at you and, and he's still against you. He's still at war with you. And when you die, it could be tomorrow, it could be eight, you know, 60 years from now, whatever. It could be 80 years from now, it could be 100, I don't know. But if God still wore you on that, on that day, that's, that's not going to go well for you. Make Christ your top priority over your sin and over yourself. And once you become a Christian, once you, once you decide to do that, decide, you know what, I, I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for Christ. Once you do that, this, this Christmas can really be a, 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 a profitable time for you to, to stop and to, to rejoice and to praise God for what he's done. Why don't you write that down for point number three? Pause this Christmas to rejoice. If you're a Christian, you, 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 can, you can do point number three. You really can. If you're not, you gotta you got do point one and two first. But if you do point one and two, you can, you, can, you can pause this Christmas and you can rejoice. For the Christians in the room, I, I don't have to tell you how great of a gift it is you have in Christ. That now... He no longer looks at your lame resume. Now he looks at Christ's perfect resume instead. Why? Because Jesus came. Because of the incarnation. When Christ took on flesh. That's exactly what Mary does in verse 19 if you're still in Luke 2. Look at verse 19 here with me. Luke 2.19 says, but Mary treasured up all these things, everything that had happened to her, everything that the shepherds had told her about what happened to them in the fields. She treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. She treasured these things. She kept them. She preserved them. She thought about them. She meditated. You're familiar with that word? We talked about that a few times. We meditating. You're sitting there thinking about it. So Mary's sitting there. She has this baby in a shed. She throws her baby in a manger in a feeding trough with slop and everything. You know, it's, it's a weird place. And then the shepherds, they come in and they say, hey, guess what? We were out in the fields and we saw angels show up and preach to us about what Jesus is coming to do. They, they said that now there's peace on earth for those with whom God is pleased with. And your son is the one that's going to do it. Your son is the Savior. Your son, today in the town of David, a Savior who has who, who is now born, who is Christ the Lord. And she's sitting there like, wow. She, I know Mary doesn't know everything, but she knows a little bit. The angels came to her before she was going to have this, this baby and said, you know, your baby's going to save the world basically. And so she knows that. But when she sees these shepherds show up, it's like, whoa. The, it, the, God said it to these guys too. And they're coming here and they're telling me what these angels said. This is, this is awesome. This is so cool. She's sitting there treasuring them, meditating on everything she's heard. She's now pondering them in her heart. It's so important for us to stop for a minute and, and re reflect on, on goodness. It's always healthy. I, I would say in life, it's healthy to stop, to, to reflect on what God has given you. This Monday, I did it. I've now been married from last Monday for now six months, six whole months. I'm, a, I'm an expert now. So if you have any questions, come to me. You don't need to come to Ray or Eric. Uh, I'm, I'm now graduated into the six month range. I'm going on seven, six going on seven. Okay. So this Monday we went out, we went out for dinner and we just, we had dinner and we, we, we paused. We, we reflected on, on the goodness of God to us by, 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 by letting us get married, 
reflecting on the goodness of each other. Right? I'm so thankful that God put you in my life. And you know what? That's good because I know you've never been married, but marriage, it gets, it, it's crazy. Uh, there's, there's times when it's, you know, you're working hard and you're coming home late and you just want to go to bed and, you know, she's doing laundry or she's doing day and, and all, these, all these crazy things of life are going on and then you just don't ap- appreciate what you have. It's good to sometimes stop, sit down and say, whoa, before we go any farther, let's, let's take a look back. What, what has God done? Let's pause for a minute. Let's reflect. It's healthy to do that. It keeps the momentum going forward. It, it, it breaks the mundane. And that's why Christmas comes once a year. It's, it's great. Christmas comes once a year and it tells you, hey, 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 everyone, stop, pause. Look at what Christ did. Look at the incarnation. Look at that Jesus came to earth. Today in town, a Savior has now been born to you who is Christ the Lord. He's come to save you from your sin so that you who are at war with God, you who are at war with God can now have peace with him through his son. We can rejoice in that. Praise God for that. That's exactly what Mary does. That's exactly, look at what the shepherds do in verse 20. It says the shepherds return. They got back to their jobs and they started glorifying and praising God for what they had seen and heard as it had been told to them. So I want us to be, be practical this Christmas, to remind ourselves, okay, you know what? Yeah, we've got like Christmas number five with this grandma who, you know, and this uncle and, you know, this is the fifth time we celebrated Christmas because it's like December 28th now and we're still going and this is like everything's crazy and whatever. Just stop. Just stop for a minute. Just, wow. Christmas is Christ to earth so that I can have new life, so that I can have peace with the God I'm, I'm at war with. Stop for a minute. Just wow. I told you last week, when you think of a wreath, think about what the victory that you now have in Christ. And I know that was super lame and you laughed at it when I told you that. But use little things like that. You see a wreath. You, oh, wow. Yeah, why, why is that wreath on my door? Well, Christmas. Why Christmas? Jesus. Jesus came to come to this planet to, to, to live for me, to be perfect for me so that I can now stand perfect before God. Be creative this Christmas. And I know Christmas, this is not your first rodeo. You've, you've had a bunch of Christmases before, and it's so normal. It comes around, you're like, oh, turn some Christmas carols on. Oh, well, mom's baked Christmas cookies. Oh, well, presents. Oh, well, more presents. Oh, more presents. Oh, you know, apple cider. I don't know, whatever you're into. Uh, that was super random, but it becomes so normal to us. But I don't want it to be normal to us. I want, I want us to, to stop, to reflect, be like, wait a minute. This, is, this shouldn't be normal. This shouldn't be normal that the God of heaven and earth sent his own son to give me peace with him. That's not normal. Use this Christmas to to pause and reflect and to glorify God. As I was putting this together, I'm convicted that, you know, I don't take those little moments in life during the Christmas season to to stop and to pause and reflect and to praise God for what he's done. So I need to do it too. We all need to do it. Christmas is not normal. I don't want us to waste this Christmas by enjoying the distractions. I don't want us to waste this Christmas by keeping our attention and our praise on things that we shouldn't, on presents, on family, on, on anything like that. I, I want us to keep our, our, not only our attention like we talked about last week, but now our praise on, on, the, on the right person to praise. Focusing our attention, worshiping Christ, who is the reason for the seasons. I want to close with one last text. You don't need to turn there with me. I'm going to read it to you. Maybe just close, close your Bible, close your notes for a minute. I'm going to read this passage here to you from Isaiah chapter 9. Written 400 years before Jesus came to earth. Yet it is so clear. It is so distinctly about Jesus. But it was written 400 years before Jesus even came. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, you guys listening? Just because I said put your Bible away doesn't mean you stop listening. Are your notes? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name 
shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the last thing is Prince of Peace. That was written 400 years before Jesus even came to this planet. That was 400 years before the, the goat of all praises ever happened. Isaiah is saying, hey, the Prince of Peace, the one that is coming to bring peace with God, a vertical peace with God is coming. What a great day that is. So I want to stop for a minute, pause, reflect on what God has done. So bow your heads with me. I'll pray for a minute, but I want you just right now just to think. Just sit there with your eyes closed, heads bowed. Just think about what Christmas is all about. Think about what Jesus came to do. Just think the incarnation. Christ has come to be the Prince of Peace. Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you that you've built into our calendar, really, a reminder for us to stop and to praise you for what you have done for us. God, reminding us of the gospel, reminding us that your son has come to save us from our sin. God, we are thankful for the peace that he brings. We are thankful that the Prince of Peace is here. For unto us, A child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government should be upon his shoulders. The mighty God is the everlasting father. He's also the prince of peace, God. We're so thankful that you have sent the prince of peace to this planet to make us right with you, God. We have no dealings with you. We should not even be able to talk to you, let alone live for you with the hope of eternity with you. God, Thank you so much for Christmas. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ coming to live in my place, to be perfect in my place, to to exhibit righteousness in my place so that I can now have peace with you, God. Thank you for that. I pray this Christmas for all of these students here in this room, God, you would help them stop. You would remind them Help them reflect on the goodness that you've now shown to them and to us. God, be glorified this Christmas season. God, right now as we as we turn to song, God, I pray that we really would sing out with a different kind of fervor than we did before this sermon. Because we just looked at what you now have done for us, the peace that you have given us, God. We love you and we're so thankful for what you've given us at Christmas time. In Jesus' name, amen.